Welcome to the Mike and Allison After Hours Podcast with your host, Mike Sheila and Allison Haas, talking business with real business owners in the Mid-Atlantic region. Today's episode is sponsored by Advantage Industries. When you need business technology, get Advantage Industries to protect and promote your business. To learn more, go to www.getadvantage.com and schedule your first meeting to see if you qualify for a free network scan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mike and Allison After Hours. I am your host, Mike Sheila, and with me today is the always insightful and often intense Allison Haas. Allison, how the heck are you today? I identify with those two statements, Mike, and I don't have to look them up, so thank you. I am great. You are very welcome. Well, to our listening audience and to our viewing audience, we are finishing up our three-part higher education leadership series this week with Dr. Kim Schatzel of Towson University, and we're going to introduce Dr. Schatzel in just a moment. But as I mentioned last time, we have a fantastic new giveaway for our viewing and listening audience. All you have to do is subscribe. You may subscribe on our YouTube channel. You may subscribe on Podbean or, frankly, any platform that you like because we are on iTunes. We are on iHeartRadio. We are on Audible. You can ask Alexa. We are on Spotify. The list goes on and on and on. Find your favorite platform, subscribe, and be sure to leave a comment because comments are how you get your chance to win. And our next giveaway is the fantastic book, on Emotional Intelligence, written by my good friend, Eric Williamson, and you're going to love the title of this book, How to Work with Jerks. <laughs> Fantastic book. You're really going to enjoy it, and Eric will go so far as to personalize it and ship it right to your door. So be sure to subscribe. Be sure to comment on your favorite platform. So today, we are finishing up our series of higher education and leadership. We have had Dr. Nito Cobain, president of High Point University, who was an American immigrant who did not speak English, had $50 in his pocket when he came to this country, and went on to build multiple successful businesses, became a national speaker, a global public speaker, published many books, and drove High Point University to the level of success it is today. On our last episode, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who was arrested as a 12-year-old <laughs> for the civil rights movement, who, by the way, was a sophomore in high school at 12, because, you know, everybody's right. a sophomore in high school at the age of 12, particularly back in the 60s. A man with tremendous depth and experience going through. And now we have featured some tremendously powerful women leaders on this show. And I'm glad to add Dr. Kim Schatzel to that list, president of Towson University. Dr. Schatzel, welcome to Mike and Allison After Hours. How are you today? I'm very, very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, particularly when I'm in the company of two presidents who I admire greatly. We are happy to have you. And for our listening audience, here's how this came around. I, I have ties to all of the schools. Uh, my daughter goes to High Point. I am a UMBC graduate. And with Towson, I was very active with them as a consultant for several years, uh, specifically through their marketing program and also through their career services program. I had the great benefit of, first of all, being a judge at two of the sales challenges that the marketing department puts on. And I have done, I, and I'm not exaggerating, I've done at least a dozen presentations to various graduating classes on using LinkedIn to find a job after graduation. So I have a depth of experience with Towson University. It has a special place in my heart. And Dr. Schatzel, here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take you through the who, what, where, when, why, how part of the show. And that's your platform to tell us whatever you want us to know about you as a person, about Towson University, what's going on. Because I know uh, the word building comes to mind. Building, building, building comes to mind when I think of Towson University. And then Allison's going to take you through the leadership segment. Does that sound good? That sounds fantastic. Wonderful. So let's start, Dr. Schatzel. Who, what, where, when, why, how? Who are you and what is Towson University? Uh, that's a great place to start. I, I always start by talking a little bit about 
myself because of the fact that my background coming to higher ed is is pretty atypical. Um, my first job out of college in 1978 was a second shift trim supervisor, um, actually a foreman um, for Ford Motor Company. I was making Pintos in the touch and assembly plant. Oh my gosh. And I was a second shift trim foreman. And uh, I was a foreman uh, because they didn't have gender neutral titles back then. Now they call them production supervisors. Uh. Um, so I spent, um, uh, I, I was a foreman. I was a plant superintendent. I was a uh, manufacturing manager and a product engineer and uh, spent about 20 years in manufacturing. Um, and uh, part of it was as a CEO of a company uh, that I had founded. Uh, so I was an entrepreneur as well. And the company was the largest powdered metal component company in the United States and the second largest in the world. We did advanced manufacturing for the automotive industry. There's 28 pounds of powdered metal in every car. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as I said, I was the CEO of the company. We had four uh, locations um, on five continents. And we employed about 1,500 people around the world. Um, so I did that. And at the age of about 38, um, I decided that um, it was time to switch gears. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to start another company. I didn't want to go work for somebody else. And I decided to take a look at getting a PhD. So I ended up getting a PhD uh, in marketing um, and management of technology from Michigan State University uh, and then act entered academics. Um, so I'm right now one of only 2% of college presidents, university presidents that have significant C-suite background um, and, and an academic background. So um, I've been very blessed to have two fantastic careers and I recommend repotting yourself around 40 to a lot of people <laughs> um, because it kind of stretches you to be able to do that. So, uh, you know, after I spent time in business and as an entrepreneur, um, I was a faculty member and then ended up uh, coming into administration, mostly in terms of the fact that I had skill sets uh, for business development, for lack of a better phrase, to mm -hmm. be able to be uh, an externally focused uh associate dean and then i became dean of the business school at university of michigan dearborn then i was the provost at um eastern michigan university so pretty typical movements in terms of an academic career and then five and a half years ago um, i came to towson university and um uh, it's just been uh, more than i had um ever um, wanted to be able to do in terms of being having the opportunity to work at such a wonderful institution in a wonderful state. Um, Maryland values education, va values higher education. And, and as you can well imagine, I'm a tremendous proponent of higher education and the what it does in terms of transforming lives and giving opportunity. Um, Towson was very attractive to me. I wanted this job very, very badly when I was recruited for it. Um, we're the second largest university in the state of Maryland. We're the fastest growing university in the state. We have 23,000 students uh, across 11 majors. But, uh, and one of the things that we're most proud of is um, our, our, our success in terms of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, yeah. We're one of very few universities in the United States where there is no completion gap. That is our minority Pell eligible students graduate at the same rate, which is the second highest in Maryland as the general population. Um, that is tremendously atypical uh, within higher education. Um, and we do it at scale. We, we have 23,000 students, over 40% of our students are, are um, students of color and almost 30% of our students are black. Um, so this is a place where we've been recognized uh, over the last few years for our success in that area and, and, and an inclusive excellence in student success. But we've got a great team that works in that space. Um, and there's a large commitment from the university to be able to do that. Um, You've mentioned buildings. Um, when I came here, one of the things that we realized right away is Towson's almost doubled in size in the last 20 years, and we just didn't keep up with uh, <laughs> that, that in terms of the infrastructure that was required. Additionally, um, 
we are um, uh, right next to Towson itself. That's mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're right up the block. Um, and that's the county seat for Baltimore County. Um, it's got a dense core. And I really felt very strongly as an anchor institution for Maryland and for greater Baltimore to be able to create more connective tissue between the university and uh, Towson itself. You could, I don't know if you, when you drive around universities, you often get a sense of the fact that the back of the university is facing the outside. Uh, you don't get this sense that it's really pulling the outside in. So we were pretty deliberate in terms of doing that. Um, so if you take a look at uh, within a quarter mile radius of Towson University, there's about three quarters of a billion dollars that is being invested either by the university or private developers. Um, that includes the fact that we've got about 2,000 students that are now living off campus. Uh, Towson Row is a development that Greenberg and Gibbons is doing, um, and that's including a Whole Foods. So Towson has a Whole Foods and there we go. Trader Joe. So if you got a Trader Joe and a Whole Foods in town, you've made it. I mean, that's one of the, <laughs> that's one of the signals. Um, but that three quarters of a billion dollars of investment, as far as we can find out, is the largest per square foot. Uh, in the state of Maryland. And, and I really think that Towson University and its reputation and its impact uh, and its commitment to serving the public good, it's really motivated that kind of investment for the university and for the area. Dr. Schatzel, thank you for that. You, you brought something up that Allison and I have talked about off screen several times, but we haven't yet brought it up with one of the higher education leaders. For, from my perspective, and you mentioned being someone experienced with as a CEO. And to run an effective higher education, not only are you the executive of a large corporation, because that's what a college is. There's, there's a lot that goes into running a successful university, but you're the mayor of a not so small town. <laughs> I mean, you, you you said it, all the students you have, and I, I know the faculty and the raw staff and you know, everybody from the person that is the, the janitor all the way up to the executive suite. I mean, there are thousands of people that count on you and your leadership team to make the right decisions. So I'm just cu a little curious about how that CEO perspective has impacted the direction you've taken Towson University. Um, I always describe, mayor of a small town is a great way to describe a university president because of the fact that there is a, a secular and there's a, a pastoral quality to the job, just like you see with, with uh, elected officials. And we are serving the public, particularly in public education. Um, so I think it's a great way to be able to describe it. Um, you know, I also tell people that, um, you know, we, we're about a $700 million company, if you're going to call us a company, um, that has over $2 billion of assets under control. And we have 23,000, quote, customers, a quarter of which turn over every year. Mm -hmm. um, so when I describe it that way to people who are like, is it like a business? And they hear me describe it that way. They're like, this is a really complicated and it's a complicated big business yep. to be able to run. Um, so, so the business side of it, I think, is particularly critical. I, I feel really committed to that from the standpoint that, you know, 80 percent of our money comes from uh, the pockets of our students. Um, and 20% come from the taxpayers of the state of Maryland. So I am very, very focused on providing the absolute best return to those two stakeholders in terms of the education that people receive on this campus. Um, and I speak to it that way. It's really about making sure that we're providing accessible, high quality education um, and that we're able to support the research requirements as well. Um, I think being a CEO, I talk a lot to panels about um, being president and what it what what's it, you know what's it like. Um, and one of the things I talk about is being a CEO. Um, until you're a CEO, you, you're you're not you don't realize what it's like and the fact that the buck actually stops with you. <laughs> um, that you have to deal with quote fires every day and every week. But you always got to stay focused on that horizon, on the big, and I talk about pushing big boulders uphill, 
I'm very much a management by objective person with my team uh, where we pick three, four or five things that we're just going to work on getting done that will move us forward in terms of the, the, the bigger goals that we have strategically. Um, and I think that's really important for an organization to be able to do. So my leadership style is incredibly consultative. I, I really feel strongly about collaboration as a leadership style and a culture um, of an organization. So I think I bring that kind of sensibility to my job as a president, where collaboration, communication, consultative nature, transparency, um, stick to and persistence um, are really valued. Um, the, uh, the other side to it is, is the fact that you get to be around young people. I mean, I always talk about the fact that whenever I think I've had a hard day um, <laughs> and I feel sorry for myself, um, I go on t- out and uh, leave my office, walk around, maybe go to the cafeteria, sit down with some students and realize that I've got the best darn job in the world to be able to have the opportunity to serve them and to be able to serve uh, the families and the faculty as well. Wow. And, and what a great segue, Dr. Schatzel. So I'm going to hand you off to Allison now to get more into those leadership qualities that you were talking about. But before I do, let's say that there is an eager or earnest student that would like to go to Towson, or maybe a returning student, maybe somebody repotting themselves at the age of 40 and they want to go for that advanced degree. Or maybe there's someone hearing this and saying, you know what, it's high time I cut them a check. Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with Towson University? Well, if you go to our website in terms of applications, and that's www.towson.edu, uh, that's the best place to be able to go, both for applications as well as for uh, donations. And if you just go there, you'll find both. And we would love to be able to have the opportunity to talk to, to students. The pandemic has done a lot in terms of people thinking about what they want to do, where they want to go next. Um, So we're seeing a lot of folks that might have stepped away from their career uh, in academics or going to school as a student to come back and talk to us. And we really want to talk to them to be able to see what we can do to be able to support their, uh, you know, their aspirations. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Allison, take it away. This is going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, Mike is seeping into my section, but that's okay. <laughs> it, it, we, we, this is Mike and Allison, right? So thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I have to say, you, um, I'm a Baltimore County former resident. I'm a Howard County resident now, but I'm born and raised. My mom had a dental practice across from Bill Bateman's right there off York Road. So right at Towson University, I lived in Towson for several years and growth is an understatement, right? Just, you just drive through and you think, holy moly, um, it's, it's its own, it's its own city, right? It's, it's amazing. So, um, we appreciate the efforts that you put in and, and your care, right? So I know I'm particularly curious about the, the transition from true business at the executive level to higher education. What are the parallels, the differences? Talk to us a little bit about that. I, I think the you know, Going back to this, the mayor comparison, I think is important because of the fact that um, you've got, I think, multiple constituent groups that you don't really have in terms of business, where where you're looking at um, uh, neighborhoods that are around you. When you're looking at economic development for the state, I spend a lot of time talking to the legislature as well as the governor's office to be able to, um, uh, you know, advocate and communicate uh, the impact that Towson University has on the future of this state, uh, yeah. not just from the graduates that we produce that are in uh, uh, critical areas of workforce development, but as an anchor institution in terms of our employment, we're the, we're the, uh, the fifth largest employer in Baltimore County. Uh, mm-hmm. We're in the top 20 in terms of the state. We produce 6,000 highly educated, um, well-educated graduates every year. So, so we have that kind of impact. Um, and but we also need to take a look at it, as I said, from a from a, a pastoral or a spiritual or, you know, just beyond numbers and beyond economic and workforce development. But how are we impacting the culture? How are we creating global citizens uh, on this campus so that when they leave, that they're positioned uh, much better to provide a, a leadership uh, perspective that is going to be successful and going to be able to um promote the type of values that we're looking for. And that's where diversity and inclusion in terms comes again. 
you know, I always talk about diversity and inclusion from the standpoint that we have the social justice aspect of it. Mm. But we also, I firmly believe you cannot have a high quality classroom without it being diverse and inclusive. Yeah. I mean, if you've yeah. got 30 people that are the same, saying the same thing, you ain't learning. You have to bring people from different backgrounds and experiences to be able to share their perspectives. So it's quality of education. And then learning, if you're a student here, you learn how to thrive and support others to thrive inclusively. That's one of the things that we want to be a hallmark of a Towson University education. So when you leave here, you're just better prepared to lead in a global uh, society in terms of the economy that we're dealing with. Um, and then um, I always talk about the fact that as a business person, it's good for business. If you yeah. take a look at the demographics in the state of Maryland, uh, within the next 10 years, we are going to be majority minority. And um, you know, if, if we're going to be a place that's going to be attractive to a state that uh, has those kind of demographics, it's important for Towson University to be able to represent that as well. I agree. I love that message. And as an HR professional, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is such a delicate, but such a, a pressing and important and valuable topic, especially right now with the last couple of years that we've endured. Absolutely. So. I, I, I agree too, and I'm actually away with a girlfriend. She's Venezuelan, so the idea of having different cultures and diversity in one room, I've learned so much from her in 12 hours just from the, the different ways that we were raised. I, I absolutely agree. You know, We are who we surround ourselves by, so I love that. So from a team aspect, right, the buck stops with you, but there's a lot of people passing the buck up to you, right? So talk to us about how you prioritize and manage your day having so many moving parts um, and, and the emphasis you place on the team members and, and um, how you allow them to help you and leverage them. Um, so I have a fantastic, so I, one of my superpowers, as I describe it, is I, it. Build, yeah. I build great teams. And I consider the fact that that is an absolute requirement of someone in my role is the first requirement is that um, hiring people, um, developing them um, and 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 being able to have the team work collaboratively. So one of the one of the things about my teams that, that I work on is, is I always want it to be a diverse team and we are a diverse team. That's a change from when I first came to Towson. And again, because you hear different voices yep. and people bring different experiences when we talk about things and we're trying to problem solve. So I always encourage my team to reflect on a few things. One is, is if something comes to us it means it's really complicated mm. because somebody else would have done it. So it's, yep. it tends to be ex extraordinary and exceptional. So the first thing you need to do is that's why we need to talk about it yep. um, because there is no obvious solution. Uh, there's various options and we have to be able to try those on as a team to be able to determine what steps we might be able to take. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious of treating decisions differently there's decisions that you make that you can step back away from, and there's decisions that you can make where the door slams shut behind you, and that's the phrase that I use. If we're going to make a decision about the, that, that's going to have a door slam shut behind us, we'll probably spend uh, more time considering the consequence of that as well um, and to be able to know what those are. And then one of the other um, isms that I always uh, talk to people about is the fact that um, I, I say I, I have to make sure that I focus on things that only the president can do. Mm. Um, Love it. Bingo and, moment. And, 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 I, and I tell my vice presidents and my deans the same things. Be, make sure you do that. Because if, if I don't do the things that only a president can do, they don't get done. Right. And it's really to, to get drawn into or get distracted by or feel um, that you need to become involved in things that are actually things that other people can do and other people are doing effectively. You support them, but really stay focused on what your responsibilities are uh, or you, so nobody else is going to step into those roles. I love that. I love that. And so to those other leaders listening who don't have as much minutia underneath, how what would you advise them to do in order to focus on doing the things that only they can do? How, how have you let go of control, so to speak, right, and allowed other people the opportunity to take care of those things? 
Well, that's what that's that's where I think having a good team allows you to do that and building that team and building that trust in the team to be able to do it. Um, the, the other the other, you know, uh, lesson that I try and be able to have the folks that work for me know is the fact of communicate over communicate and communicate early. Um, uh, a lot of times nice. when we're when, a lot of times when we're dealing with something, as I always describe it, you can you can see the thunderclouds in the distance. So if, if it looks like, you know, just bring it up, just say, hey, yep. you know, you know, just want to let you know that this this is this is kind of out there and we're managing it. We don't know everything about it, but we're managing it and we'll kind of keep you in the loop. So if it does go sideways and suddenly becomes something more urgent, um, it's not the first time that we ha- that we as a team haven't heard of, heard of it. You know, it's yep. not like you go, what? I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> and then everybody gets defensive or they start to freeze, their brain goes into lockup, um, and you tend to be uh, less um, uh, less productive that way. So I really believe in over-communication and communicating early. Uh, the other thing that, that I, I have as, as a, uh, just something that I do with my teams is I, is I have all of my senior leadership team name a second. So they've got someone who if they're on vacation or they're not there or, you know, for whatever reason, that individual attends my cabinet meetings. They basically act like them for the time that the person is not there. Uh, And it does two things. One is it's a developmental opportunity for the individual to be able to kind of be part of the senior leadership team and understand what, what we do. Um, as well as the fact that if there ever is a crisis on the campus for some reason, um, that we're not going into the room to be able to deal with it and saying to somebody, hello, so I'm Kim Schatzel and who are you? Like, we, you know, we might see them in the hallways, <laughs> but we don't know them well and they don't right. know us well. And it's during those types of events of crisis where you really, really need to have trust and you really know, have to know how to work with each other. Um, so that's an important part that I, that I make sure that we have is we have people that, uh, we kind of broaden the team. We have people that we can bring in and have those kind of experiences. That's great. And I love just that simple idea of talk about it, right? But it's so hard to do. If you don't practice talking, talking is very hard to do, (laughs) but it eliminates the lightning bolts, right? You can see the thunderclouds, but you don't get impaled by the actual hail and the storm. So, oh, I know. Yeah. And, and you, just, you and you you just you're far more productive. You have much higher quality decision making. Um, and again, you can be consultative. People will often say to me, how come you bring in somebody from like advancement in to talk about something that has to deal with a student issue? And the reason is, is because he's smart. Um, you know, so I bring the whole team together, even if they're not involved, because they're all very talented. And often, if they don't have skin in the game, like they're not going to be impacted, they'll yeah. bring a perspective that's often incredibly valuable because they'll think of it differently. Um, yeah. So I I, I enjoy having a, 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 having a, an entire team weigh in. And what I'm hearing is you give people opportunity and permission to be a part of the team, right? Without without a title or a certain jurisdiction. I, I love that. Everybody's included, which makes people care more and feel like they belong, which makes people more engaged and work harder and you have a more successful enterprise, right? So I think that's brilliant. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to, to part with, you know, if you could surmise your career and and tell a young buck who wants to be you one day, if you could shave some time off the learning curve, what would you share? Um, I, I think that you should always um, um, stretch yourself. I I've never, you know, I, and I, particularly for women, I think that women have, they feel compelled to, you know, I, I don't know if I can do it. Or am I prepared to do it? There's there's a sense of the fact that I need to be um, over prepared or or, or 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 in that position not to fail. Um, and and you know, I I'm old enough now. I failed a whole bunch of times. I've made a whole bunch of mistakes, and and that's as important as the successes. So if I was going to give a, a young buck uh, uh, some advice. Um, one is, is I would, I would try and go into those opportunities that stretch you. Um, 
I think that's that's really important to be able to do. Um, I also think it's important to be able to, when I was an entrepreneur, I used to just call, I would meet somebody and want to pitch something and see if they were interested in it and they weren't, but I would always end with, is there anybody that you know that I might be able to have a cup of coffee with that I could have this conversation with? And mm. they would say, sure. And they would refer me. Um, so soft ties, as they're described, is super important to be able to reach out to people um, and to be able to get that kind of uh, advice or input or counsel or ideas from someone that's not in your circle um, and often can bring you uh, some really good advice uh, in terms of career management or decision making. Dr. Schatzel, you were sensational this morning. So thank you for, for brightening my morning. This was I've had a great a lot time of fun. at 8.30 in the morning. That's right. <laughs> but you to guys, our listening you guys audience. made it easy, I have to tell you. Oh, you were great. Thank you so much. Mike. Yeah. Do- Dr. Schatzel, I, I echo what my co-host just said. Uh, thank you. You you reinforced several themes that we have heard, and you brought to light a lot of the things that Allison and I talk about all the time as far as being a business leader, being a great sales professional and all the parallels between the two roles within an organization. So thank you so much for joining Mike and Allison at after hours today. We super grateful to have you on today. Have Very a great much day. So. Thank you, Mike and Allison. My pleasure. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So how <laughs> impressive was that? I'm just going to curse. She's a badass. I mean, (laughs) she embodies confidence and humility, right? There was not one nuance of arrogance or like she just exudes confidence from experience and wants to share it, right? Like I would love to work for her or with her, right? Like she just, we do good, Mike. We did good. I, and and I, I mentioned this in, in the introduction, Dr. Cobain, a, an immigrant that didn't speak English with $50 in his pocket, goes on to build a business empire, become a successful speaking coach. Uh, Dr. Rabowski, at the tender age of 12 years old, decides this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. Okay. And I'm going to pay the consequences. I, if jail is the consequences of my actions, I'm going to do that because that's right. And then Dr. Schatzel comes in and says, you know what? At the age of 40, I've decided I need to do something different. I'm bigger than this. I'm better than this. And I can bring value. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. She, she brought a word up, which was pastoral. Mm. And that ties back into one of our common themes is that there there is a certain there's a guidance that comes to being a great leader and one of the things that i heard was mentorship mm-hmm. and i love the fact that all of her leaders have an understudy mhm yeah. if you're listening or watching today's show and that didn't hit you in the face as a bingo moment we'll go back and watch again because you missed yeah. one. i mean you missed yeah. there, there were a bunch in there but that, that was my first big one. So your opening thoughts on Dr. Schatz from Towson University today. Well, I really am sincere about her, her giving so many people the opportunity to be a part of the team. And, and the people that she said don't have skin in the game, per se, have an invaluable lens because they may not be immediately affected. And I would think most of us would typically count those people out and not allow them to weigh in. And she's she's telling us the opposite. Everybody has a voice and everybody has has the right voice, right? And just the the uh, idea of the the diversity aspect of the more voices in the room from different places, the the richer the environment. And you know, if we have the same people around us, we don't stretch, right? I, I that's a personal thing of mine. Like I need to stretch myself. I need to get a little uncomfortable. I need to grow and the only way I can do that is if I have different people, different voices weighing in. Because if I only hear ever, you know, oh, you're right. You're right. Good job. Good job. I'm not, I'm not stretching, right? I'm not getting better. Yeah. And let's build upon that because that, again, that ties into some of the themes that 
we have heard over our 20 plus episodes now is creating a safe environment to disagree. Mm. And yes. you have to have people that see the world differently than you. And you have to ask for their input. You don't have to accept all of it. And that, right. that's that's the important thing to remember is because some people are just going to say crackpot crazy stuff. But there's almost <laughs> always a seed of brilliance in that crackpot crazy. And, and that's to be an effective leader. That is one of your biggest challenges is to, OK, that's crazy. However, <laughs> you're making I me heard, think. I heard this, and I think we could actually use this. And this this notion of diversity and this notion of inclusion, it's just becoming more and more critical to success. You know, great great companies have a vision, they have leadership. But that's what you it's like an iceberg. That's what you, that's what you see at the surface. There are all these other things that go on behind and underneath. And and the, the notion that she brought up that she had some experience with business development mm -hmm. and how valuable that is to leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I have touched on this in the past is that you and I have both been in leadership positions. You've owned your own companies. I've been an independent mm -hmm. consultant. I've been in straight commission sales. You've done straight commission sales. There, there are a great many parallels that go with being an effective salesperson and being an effective leader. And with that, there are a lot of parallels to being a bad salesperson and being a bad leader. And I, I, I love that she's touched upon that because through all the episodes that we've done, we've seen this as a as a common theme and, and what i haven't heard anybody say is well you just need to be close-minded and <laughs> whatever everybody else says just tell them they're stupid and go do it anyway because you know best and right do it by yourself yeah <laughs> we, we haven't heard anybody say that we have not no and and she she used the word impact as well. And I was I was thinking about that and sharing that with my friend, telling her what I do this morning before the episode and how, you know, we don't just impact that employee or person under you, but we impact their family at home and then the community. And we have to have that larger lens, which a, a C, the C-suite president does. They're the visionary, right? The buck stops there. And she like she said, I have to keep my eyes on the horizon no matter what, right? And so... Um, she's got a a big tent uh, of of the minutia underneath of her, and and back to the BD, you know, I've shared in former episodes, like as the business leader, you are the the utmost salesperson. Like you you hold the vision, therefore you have the most care in theory about what ultimately ends up happening. There are lots of people under you that care too, but. Your, your the expectation is that you care the most, right? And so, what does that actually translate into in your day to day? So, yeah, she was great. That t the team aspect, and I love, you know, I have to focus on what I have to focus on, which is what you and I talk about with our industries. You know, we allow presidents to do presidents' work. If you've got your hand on everything else, you cannot be the primary BD person and the visionary and your eyes on the horizon because. There is so much else happening all the time, and you've got to allow what she said, trust other people to do those things for you. And that takes time, and that's honestly just a leap, right? A leap of faith, right? How else do you trust people? You just have to do it and let them prove otherwise, right? And that ties into something that we're seeing in the news quite a lot. Again, to our viewing and listening audience, Mike Sheila is a self-proclaimed LinkedIn nerd. I spend a ridiculous amount of time on that platform. And I have seen this for several months now leading up to this summer, which is there are a lot of business leaders that are in for a rude awakening because they are demanding that their people come back to the office. Mm. And that, that's in varying degrees. That's in, it's in varying degrees. The, the number one, and they'll give you, and we, I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago, 
that we make decisions emotionally and then we rationalize them with logical facts, which is why arguments never work because we will, here's all the evidence to show why you're wrong. And the other person goes, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, I feel the way that I feel. Yeah, that's way I feel, more powerful. I feel, I feel the, the way that I feel. But with that, these people are, there's going to become an imbalance because there are plenty of companies that are exceptionally open to the hybrid work environment now that have recognized, hey, there are at bare minimum, there are key departments of my company that have thrived yes. working in this environment. Yes. And why would you want to throttle that other than you just can't let people do their jobs. You yeah. feel like you have to have your finger in the proverbial pie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I just think from a mental health standpoint, like I'm a perfect, I'm in the Smoky Mountains right now, if nobody knew. I'm in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Don't live here, right? I'm in, I'm typically in Maryland doing these podcasts, but, but I logged on early. Actually, I was the earliest today. Did you take note of that? Just so, just so you know. Um, <laughs> but like my mental health, in a virtual environment has has increased because I'm not in the car, I'm not in traffic, I'm not commuting. And so my level of attentiveness and available energy to be attentive to my prospects is so much higher. And I'm not saying I'm never going to go back to an in-person meeting. I'm just saying that I don't have to or feel like I I it's imperative to my job. But like my my mental health and my energy and satiation on a day-to-day -day is just so much higher because um, I'm not being pulled elsewhere. And I know not all personalities can work from home and thrive, but you know, my, my boss has allowed me to do this and I've proven that I can. And so they're like, okay, right. We're going to trust you until you tell us otherwise. And I just think from a leadership perspective, allowing people to show you that they can be trusted. Not everyone can, we all know that, but you know, for those of us that can, you know, you don't have to put us under your thumb. Um, and if you don't release the thumb long enough to see if that's true, you're just going to exhaust yourself trying to control all the pieces you can't really control anyway. Yeah, I actually I had a personal experience with this about six or seven years ago now. So uh, and I've, I've mentioned this before. I, I have a son with autism and attending to his needs can often be a challenge for my wife and I. And there was a point where. <laughs> We we had him in daycare and that made things challenging. So mm. my wife and I, for the longest time, we didn't have any vacation or PTO time because we were constantly taking it to take a day off to care for him. And we had a woman work for us in our home several years that took care of him, got him off the bus, got him on the bus till we got home. And she came to us one day and said, I I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do this anymore. And she she had her reasons. We were sad to lose her, but we understood why. And I went into my boss's office one day and said, hey, just so you know, um, things are going to be a little dicey for me the next few months until we find a, a daycare provider for my son. And she said, well, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, the woman that was watching Mikey, she can't work for us anymore. I said, so my wife and I are going to have to split the difference. You know, some days I'm going to have to work from home. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, or I, I said, I'm going to have to come into the office late so I can get him off the bus. And I'll have to leave the office early so and get him on. the. And she said, well, why don't you just work from home? And my first reaction was, son of a bitch. I've been working here three years and now <laughs> let me work from home. But the, the other immediate reaction was gratitude. You know, yes. Thank you so much. Yes. And the first couple weeks were very rocky. Now, mm -hmm. I have always been that if you want to know what I'm doing, just look at my calendar right. because my stuff is on my calendar because right. I can't remember everything I'm doing. So I put everything on my calendar. Right. right. And the, this this one day in particular was to be an office day. And I understood that. And I had a standing meeting, I think, at nine o'clock on Friday mornings, nine or ten o'clock. I forget which. So I went to that meeting and as I'm sitting in the office of that meeting, I get an email from my manager that says, where are you? And I wrote back, I said, I'm in a meeting. She said, well, you're supposed to be in the office today. 
I said, you are correct, except I'm in a meeting. And if you looked at my calendar, you would know that. Mm. And she wrote back, obviously, I didn't look at your calendar. And I said, obviously, you didn't. <laughs> so I was got into the office about an hour later. And now, let me qualify this. My manager at the time, uh, still a good friend today. So all these years later, still somebody I greatly, deeply admire and trust. And I had developed a relationship with her that I could, I could have safe space to argue and disagree with her. And I forget what she said, and it just infuriated me. Mm. And I looked at her and I said, okay, fine. And I said it just like that. And she goes, no. she said, no, wait, 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 come back, Mike. Let, let's talk about this. I said, I promise you, you don't want to hear anything I have to say right now. And she said, no, 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 no. Lay it on me. And she she. She spent five, 10 minutes saying, look, Mike, I trust you. This is just new and I've just got to figure things out. And I said, your actions do not match your words. And she looked at me and said, what? I said, you're telling me you trust me. What you did this morning Polar shows opposite. you don't trust me. Yep. And I said, and I don't know that that's me or that this situation is hard for you to handle. And she said, I'm I'm so very sorry. Mm. I So again, what makes a great leader? Nobody's perfect, but we had that and we were fiery. We were firing shots off at one another. Yeah. And she was able to say I told you I was going to give you this and I've not acted appropriately and for that I apologize. And okay. for a leader, for leadership that's exceptionally hard to do. Yep. And I'll, uh, back to my original point. If you're listening to our show or you're watching our show and you own a business and you have employees, you have to ask, why am I requiring people to come back to the office? Now, there may be some people have a have a conversation with that person around their productivity because it's not about the fact that they are working from home it's about their productivity and that's the yeah. other thing i think a lot of leaders miss mm. is the thing that you think is the problem is rarely the actual problem right it's a symptom of the problem yeah and you and I see that every day. I mean, you're an HR professional. 90% of your problems aren't actually the problem. They're just the same right. Of the problem, right? Right. Yeah. And I think this whole topic is just, we've had to pivot so much in the last year and a half. And a whiplash. <laughs> yes. And some people, we were forced to change, right? Like there was an element of this is non-negotiable. This is what we have to do. And some people smoothly went into that, right? Like she said, you're you're stretching yourself. If you're always stretching, then that's not as as a hard of a knock as if you're somebody that this is what we do, period, the end. And I, you know, when I'm prospecting and I come up on a website that's very old, it's impossible to find my person that I want to contact and they make it very very difficult to get in touch with them. I think they probably lack the mindset of what I of who I want to partner with. Right. Agreed. Um, and I and and um, you know, or fat. Well, we have family owned businesses, so I can definitely talk about this, but like typical family owned that's been around for decades and decades and decades, a lot of times lack that stretch mentality, right? Because it's been working for so long. This is how we've done it. By now, you don't even know why you do it anymore. That's just why how it's done. So we just keep doing it. And I just think with what we've endured the last year and a half you know, people got knocked around. And so now it's like, okay, I get to, to control again. Let's go back to, and it's like, have you even assessed whether or not you have to go back to, or if you were in the change that was thrust upon us was actually a positive. Right. And I, we saw that and we interviewed a lot of leaders, like those that, that were able to pivot and turn this into an opportunity have thrived. And those that haven't 
I mean, there's a lot of people out of business and some of that is circumstantial, like some businesses, right. like there was, there was no alternative and that just sucks. Um, but there's, a, there are also a lot of people that, you know, like my industry, we always met face to face always. And for me, I broke my leg just before COVID. So I couldn't, I was on my phone and my computer. That's how I had to work. I couldn't drive. Hell if they picked me up once or twice and I crutched my way into the office, they carried all my stuff. And I'm like, guys, this is unmanageable. I bet we can do this differently. So I worked from home and I, I proved that I could. And I learned how I had never sold my sale without using a whiteboard ever. Here I am now on my phone because I didn't think about Zoom and I don't want to stare at myself all day. And I'm talking through my whiteboard in words. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can do this. Right. And so I learned how to sell my my sale differently. And um, here we are. Right. A year plus a year and a half later. And um, things are fine. Right. So I just think if you're listening and you have a hard time re relinquishing control if you're really tired at the end of the day, a lot of that is 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 preventable, right? Like for me, when I'm trying to control every piece, I'm exhausted and I'm not my best self and I'm certainly not my best business development, right? And I'm not giving other people the opportunity to do their job. And then they don't want to do it either, right? Like what you were just talking with management, that makes you less apt to want to work hard for that person, at least for me. When I feel like you don't trust me, and you don't allow me the dignity to be an adult and a, and, a, and a good employee, I'm less apt to show up early and get to work, right? Because screw you. That's the human, you're like, we're all like that, right? We're like, you know what? You told me I, I have to, so I'm not gonna, right? Um, but anyway, that could go in a totally different direction for a very long time, and I'm not gonna do that. But I hear you, yeah. is what I'm saying. And to, to go along with that for a moment, as I mentioned, that 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 sales manager, uh, my friend Hunter Picklick, uh, she was my manager for three and a half of the four years that I worked at Earthlink. And that three and a half part is critical because that summer we went through a radical shift in the company, uh, specifically, and we, I I remember just being. Shot this. It was the month of July, and the Baltimore sales office had arguably had their best month in a very long time. Uh, I think we had three sales reps, and each one of us was somewhere between a hundred and two hundred percent above our monthly quota. Wow. Like I was the lagger, and I was two and a half times my number that month. Wow. We just, we had an exceptional month. And, and as you know, sales is as much about timing as everything else. Yep. You know, I did 15 grand and then the other rep, I think she did 25 and another one did 30. I mean, it was a staggeringly good month. And we come in the next day and find out that something like 70% of the sales force in the country had been riffed. Reduction in force, if you're not familiar with that term, rift. And every sales manager was told, okay, you are no longer a sales manager. You have two options. You can A, take a severance package, which I think they were offering them six months or 12 months or something like that. Or you can become an account manager. So you can become a rep. And then every sales director was also demoted and made into regional sales managers. So my sales director, who I did not like in the least bit, was now my immediate supervisor. And the way that he managed us, I describe only as despicable. Mm -hmm. It was the where I had built this great relationship with my sales manager. And we had a give and take and we could talk and we could argue and we could help one another and we could collaborate. He was not that at all. Mm. He had little to no interest in 
doing any of that. And the thing that killed me about him was he didn't care about the customers. That just infuriated me. Like when I w- would go to Hunter and say, hey, so-and-so is having a problem. She would say, give it to me. You get back to work and I will take care of it. Yeah, that's what a manager is supposed to do. Yeah, well, well, not this guy. He very clearly told us, he said, look, I know you're all technically account managers, which means you have a deck of accounts that you have to manage. He goes, but we get paid on selling new deals and that's what matters. So anybody calls you with a problem, you tell them to go to customer care. Now, we had also just shifted to a sales philosophy where our clients had to either A, have a minimum of 200 employees or B, have 10 locations or more. I'm like, really? That's yeah. the level of client you just want me to send to customer care without doing any sort of triaging or any type of support. You just want me to say, FO, good luck. We have customer care. And our customer care sucked. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Allison, your parting thoughts on today? Another fantastic episode. Grateful for you. Thank you, sir. I'm grateful for you. I really... um I just, I learned so much. I say it every time. Selfishly, listen listen or watch or don't. It works for me, right? So I, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just listen. so grateful. Please listen, please watch. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why you're here. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just grateful and just, I'm going to take that stretch mentality into my day, right? Like I just really, um, we have something to learn from everyone, right? So I'm grateful. I'm grateful. A great way to end the episode. So for Mike and Allison after hours, I am Mike Sheila. She is Allison Haas. And please, everyone, remember, people helping people, it's powerful stuff. We'll see you again very soon. See ya. Thank you for joining Mike and Allison after hours. Tune in next time for another great business owner sharing valuable industry ideas. Want to be a guest on our show? Contact us at answers at getadvantage.com.